Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk through. Um, uh, I'm going to talk through this our, our model of public common partnerships. I was talking to quite a few people over, over lunch about um, their engagement with public civic partnerships um, around various institutions. And this is our model is sort of builds on that experience, but slightly different, I think. And so we're going to sort of talk about talk about that. Um, and in fact. To start off by sort of discussing the, our analysis of the situation and, and the problem that we see, which is the problem of transition. And this problem of transition is the problem of our age, basically. And there are lots of resources we can draw and think about this problem of transition. I'll explain that in a moment. So, this is that. Let me explain the problem upon which we started to do the intellectual work of thinking of how you might uh, come up with solutions to that problem. And um, we did that first of all in the abstract, um, sort of abstract of the public common partnership, we identify the functions we think need to happen, etc. Because when you draw up an abstract uh, model of something, that changes quite substantially when you come to actual situated uh, projects which you are you're trying to get off the ground. And so I'll talk through a variety of, of different projects that we're involved in. Um, and you'll be able to see how this abstract model is going to adjust. And in fact, I'm going to learning over, over, over this, um, uh, of this process. So we'll talk about um, the Ward's Corner Community Plan, which is a, an alternative plan for uh, the, the development of a market in, in, North, in Tottenham and North London. Um, uh, then we'll talk through a, a similar sort of urban development project in Bradford, which is by the poor city in the north of England. Then we'll talk through another project we're involved in in quite a different environment, which is the Isle of Skye, which is a relatively remote island um, of the north, uh, the north coast of Scotland, the northwest coast of Scotland. Um, so it's so a, a coastal community, a rural community. Uh, and then finally I'll talk through a project we're involved in in France, or France of the Government, which is trying to think about super production as a common set up so well, we have two sites we're trying to pursue to set up commonly owned and governed pharmaceuticals production factories. So we can talk through a lot of different uh, sectors and how that model or our thinking sort of changes but how we try to, 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 to link these these up. Um, so like I said I'm going to sort of start, start off actually by setting up this problem. I'll do it in strange way which may not which may not translate into this context. And obviously I'm going to be talking from Primarily the UK context, partly the, the, the French context. Uh, I hope we translate into, uh, in, into a, Balkan, a Balkan context, but some of it's specific, I think, and I'll talk through the specificities of that we do the unpacking. This might be specific, I'm not sure. Of it. Um, so, part of the thinking of, of, of this, of the thing I'm trying to set up, relates to a book that a friend of mine, Mark Fisher, who's a social theorist, no longer with us, um, he wrote a book. Well, he published a book in 2010 called Capitalist Realism. Um, and his theorist, his, 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 his thesis was that, um, that, that, um, that the, the capitalist reality was extensive with the whole of reality. So it would be very, very difficult, he said, for us to imagine any other form of social economic setup than the one that the iteration of capitalism, the neoliberal iteration of capitalism. Because he wrote this book from sort of 2006 up to 2009, and then it got published in 2010. And so he, he riffs on this, on this quote, uh, which is uh, uh, associated with Frederick Jameson, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. My, my, my argument is this, is these are all from the covers of books that have been published over the last two or three years, all offering various um, images or, or, or even descriptions for how the world could be organized in a different way to, to which it is now, to a different and better way than it is now to which it is been a whole explosion actually of propositions for how the world might be organized in a different way. I think what we've been lacking is any strategic analysis of the propositions for how we might get from where we are now to one of these propositions for a differently organized um, form of society. And that problem has a name, it's called the problem of transition, how we get from where we are now uh, to, to, um, 
to somewhere else, basically. There's lots of resources we, we can sort of draw on those. I want to set up this problem of transition a little bit more so that we can, I think, like outline the dimensions of it, perhaps. Uh, and I'm going to do that through this, this diagram here, which I, I, I guess it, I, I'm going to critique this diagram in a moment. I think it's a useful starting place because what I want to set up actually is a uh, is a so I'm just getting my notes organized. Um, what we're going to say is a gap between a gap between the necessary and the possible. That's a nice neat way of saying it. So a gap between where it seems uh, just logically necessary for us to get to. And what so currently seems socially and politically possible to do, there is a gap between those two things. And of course, when there is a gap between what it is necessary to do and what it is possible to do, that's where hopelessness uh, 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 comes into the picture, etc. It, and what, we're, what I would set up is that we are in this, this, this problem of transition, this escape from capitalist realism, has put us into this position of impasse, where it's very unclear what we should do and what we should do, of course. So this diagram is called the, the donut, um, and so the outer ring of this donut uh, is made up of, it was mapped by a, a collection of scientists led by Johan Rostrom um, uh, a number of years ago now, and, and they, what they did was to collect up the, all of the best available scientific uh, data to try to work out the, the tipping points of nine Earth system processes upon which continued human, human civilization depend. So one of those would be climate change, of course, the carrying capacity, the power carrying capacity of the atmosphere. Now that just exists, it doesn't matter if we believe in that or not. If that exists, it's like the boiling point of water at a certain atmospheric temperature, it's 100 degrees centigrade. It doesn't matter if you believe in that or not, that just exists out in the middle of human observation. Uh, but we don't know exactly where these are, of course, when we get to it took a while, but well, it seems experiments to work out the 100 degree boiling point of water. We look exactly where these tipping points are, so they say, these are the best estimations of the tipping points, and we will have a precautionary principle, and we'll have a boundary upon which we should not cross. Of course, tipping points are the points at which any system tips from one state into another state. So, the, of this example, to go back to my boiling point of water, is if you add energy to a system, it turns into energy to water at a certain point, you can leave one state, a liquid, and go into another state, a gas. And it's a non-linear chain when you go from a, from, a, uh, from a water, or from a liquid into a gas. You can't just reverse that, just turn the heat off and just go back into, a war, into water, the whole process of condensation, etc. So these are these tipping points on the outside. So what Rockstrom et al. They say, look, you can have any form of social, economic, and technical organization you want, as long as the outcomes of those forms of organization do not cross one of these boundaries. That, those, that's, that's one mapping of the necessary. We cannot have forms of economic, social, and technical organization which cross one of these boundaries, including the precautionary principle. Another theorist, Kate Rauer, added this inner, inner circle of the, of the um, the donut, which she calls the social foundation here, or social boundaries, she draws them from the UN Convention of Human Rights and says, most people can probably agree with those. And you can see there's all sorts of things here uh, access to water, access to health, food, energy, etc. Thanks. There seem to be a lot of diagrams that are talking about this, so it's probably good. Um, so she says, yes, yeah, so, so what we actually need, we can have, if, if it be a safe operating space, we can manage, we can have really some very level forms of organisation we would like to have. So if we add at the inner ring, we have the operating space for a safe and just, a safe and just operating space for humanity. So the idea is, this is a mapping of what is necessary that perhaps most, the majority of the population of the planet would agree on. Most people would probably sign up to the UN. Right, scientific knowledge, the, the vast consensus of scientific knowledge, so vast it could have them with the biggest consensus in the history of, of human history around these tipping points and the, the, the different in, in some ways, that maps what is necessary. It's necessary 
this is not a blueprint for, for how society has to operate. It is you can have any form of social, of social economic and technical, as long as the, the, the consequences of those forms of organisation do not move outside the. So that's some sort of mapping of the of the necessary of what it is where it's necessary to go. Uh, at the minute we're not going. We are, we're breaking several of these uh, of the boundaries on the on the, out, on the outer circle and many many of the inner circle as well. And we are not heading as, as a global economy, for instance. Uh, we are not heading within this dome at the moment. And in fact, there's a the, 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 the reason you try to create this sort of map or diagram is that so you can backcast. So we used to forecast it. So you can backcast from where we need to get to to try to think about the conditions you need to put into place in order to arrive here. So we can backcast from what is necessary and we can forecast from where we are now. Uh, but when we forecast from where we are now, you know, we operate with a relatively limited sense of what it is socially and politically possible to do. That may offer different countries, etc. But that's basically there's a limit to what it seems socially and politically possible to do under current conditions. And there is a gap between that, what it seems socially and politically possible to do, and uh, where we need to get to. There's a gap between what is possible and what is necessary. The, the, this is the problem of transition. So we need, in some way, we need a project of moving somewhere which is iterative, which pushes the, the boundaries of what is socially and politically possible. Like I said, these natural boundaries, these tipping points, they exist whether we believe in them or not. They're very hard to alter. You can alter some of them through technological innovation, of course, or, or alter our relationship with them through technical innovation. But it is, you know, the project in front of us is to expand what seems socially and politically possible. And you will have to do that in the history to you have to push forward the of possibility to, to one degree and then re reorganize and push forward again to another degree of so I'm going to now critique the diagram I've sold to you so well. <laughs> so these tipping points are the alpha, these are non-linear change. The way that Kate Rao talks about the social boundaries, she talks about them as though they are not subject to non-linear change. They are linear, that you can just, you know, perhaps move inequality goes, goes down this way, but then you can just change your mind and move back up again in a linear fashion. Right? And the way of thinking about non-linear change is like driving a car. I can drive the car along the road and I can realise I've gone in the wrong direction, I can reverse and come back and, and just change direction. It doesn't need any new sort of form of operation. If I if I drive off a cliff, I do not typically want to have a new state of falling, I cannot realise my mistake and to reverse. That's what tipping points are. And I would argue that, that a lot of the social foundations are also subject to, to non-linear change. I, I, once you go past certain limits, it's incredibly hard to get back again. And like the most obvious one that we, that we face is what we call the new inequality, the incredible rise of material inequality, uh, well over the last 40 years, in particular over the last 20 years, the rise of the oligarchs, etc. You know, that, that, that basically creates a huge amount of inertia through the necessary change that, that, that takes place. And so I, have to, we think, I think you have to think about this process of, of expanding so that the possibility in terms of non-linear change. As well. Um, there's lots of different ways in which we can, lots of resources we can draw on this problem of transition. So the word transition is a very important word in, in, in ecological thinking. Uh, in the UK, we have a movement called Transition Town, we think they can be quite alter their town sort of thing. So to adapt to, um, uh, 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 to, to the problem of climate change. But I'd argue as well, transition is also. The structuring problem of the left and the right, the problem of how we move from where we are now to where we need to get to, there's been a huge amount of thinking about that on the left, um, you know, going back uh, uh, 200 years. Quite a cross the side of that. <laughs> and there's lots we can draw on on that. Uh, um, Lenin talked about this, this problem of transition, and this problem of like, you know, we, we, we have these lines that we take, we are all, we are all the takers. And we have to move to society where we collectively govern ourselves on this problem of transition there. I perhaps we don't agree with the solution to that problem of transition, but that's the problem outline. I'm going to go to this, yeah, talk about this diagram here, which is even harder to see than the last one, which is
which is drawn by a theorist who is no longer with us, called Eric Donnelly Wright. And we did a lot of thinking about uh, the problem of transition and what we call real utopias or concrete utopias. And this is a this is a model of, of, that he draws of, of the difficulty of moving from capitalism to socialism. I would argue that the, the same the same diagram applies even if your problem is reduced to the transition from a carbon-based energy and therefore productive productive system to a decarbonized energy system. It's the same problem still applies because what this model tries to what this image tries to model is um, the difficulty of change when it when it, 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 when it uh, collides with um, the resistance of people who, uh, whose interests are not to change, basically. Whose well, interests are for things to stay the same. Uh, so what... I can't really see this diagram very well. But this is something he's trying to model, some sorts of ways he's trying to model people's standard of living. Right? He says, look, if you want to move, if you want to move from capitalism to socialism, uh, what you will be doing is, is to increase people's standard of living. But of course, you can you can make these alterations, you can change things to a certain level until they collide with the interests of those who want things to stay the same. And then you will go through a process of disruption in which people's living standards might uh, might um, collapse or, or dip down basically before they rise again because of the transition trough. Right. And now we, we, we're already seeing that transition trough in terms of, of the problem of decarbonisation. We've seen all sorts of like resistances uh, to, to the models of, of, of decarbonisation so far, etc. In the UK, there's a whole series of conspiracy theories, uh, 15 minute cities, these sorts of things taking off. Uh, it's because there's disruption to the way people live their lives now. When we're modeling this, I think we can relate this back to this problem I said about non-linear transitions in social change rather than just uh, energetic change or, or natural power. And like I said, you know, the, one of the biggest problems that we face uh, in terms of um, decarbonizing the economy and what I would argue the necessity to democratize the economy uh, is this huge rise of inequality and the, the huge disparities of political or social power and political power that that generates. So in capitalist societies, you know, the people who, who um, uh, if you have, if you have money, you can basically influence politics in about a variety of ways, by by the media, except for these sorts of things, by funding big tanks. But ultimately, if you come across a, a project which is aiming to transform society, the, the biggest um, the biggest tool of disruption that, um, that the, the ruling class or the capitalist class or the oligarchs, however you want to put that, um, they have the ability to disrupt the way people live their lives. And the, 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 the principal tool of that is what's known as a capital strike, or perhaps capital flight is another version of a capital strike. And it is basically a refusal to invest your capital in, uh, in, in um, to invest your capital, basically. So you, you pick growth, you, you have growth declines, people's living standards decline, and so people are less inclined, the general population are less inclined to maintain fidelity to the process of transforming society, or perhaps just decarbonizing society. So we're already seeing this introduction of uh, disruption of people's what might call social reproduction by carbon capital, by the fraction of capital which is invested heavily in, uh, in fossil fuels. So it's the same sort of process. The process from like one form of economic coordination to another, very similar in time to the process of shifting from one form of energy system uh, and the surrounding infrastructure that builds that energy system to another. Democratizing the economy is a very similar sort of shape to it and decarbonizing the economy. This, this, uh, this image of the transition trough, the trough of declining living standards hit a certain barrier in trying to transform society. The reason Eric Olin Wright introduces this is he says that the aim of what we need to do now is to try to make that trough as shallow as possible. <coughs> we need to, to, to remove the ability of capital, capitalist class and oligarchs to disrupt the way that people live their lives, etc. And, and the way you do that is by what it calls an interstitial transformation. So we can think about it now, perhaps we need to take more and more infrastructure
at more and more the way in which um, people reproduce themselves as members of 21st century society, take them out of private hands and put them under common control, some sort of kind of public or common control. Um, and he's very interested in projects such as workers' co op, etc. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, who could believe I was going to do this? I'm going to talk about uh, President Biden. Because as well, we use that donut, that donut diagram to forecast, to, to think backwards from where we need to get to. But you also need to forecast. You need an analysis of the current situation, the current conjuncture, in order to think about how we operate now, but we're going to the, uh, include the anticipation of moving somewhere else. So I'm going to try to do a really quick analysis of what might be, might be happening. But the underlying, the underlying uh, problem of, the, of, of the, the conjuncture, the thing that's really driving the problem of the conjuncture, well, there's two things. There's the, the need for a free transition. There's also what's known as secular stagnation, which is just a long-term stagnation in the rates of growth on a global level, but in certain countries, that's a particular problem, the UK being one of them. In terms of growth, but also in terms of what growth there is being used to uh, provide people with increased living standards or just maintaining living standards. So this is a global problem. We can this is debate when it starts. There are arguments that set up this start in the 1970s. Others, you know, it's, it's a longer term problem which becomes incredibly clear from 2008, the crisis of 2008. The difficulty is starting a new regime of capital accumulation. Just to give you an idea of that, in the UK, where I'm from, so the wage levels are now at the same level as they were in 2005. So they've not reached this, they're at the same level as 2005. So that's 18 years um, of zero wage growth. So that's never happened in the UK before for 220 years since the Napoleonic War. This is, and this is it's particularly bad in the UK, but it's a pattern which is, which is repeated um, across most of the globe. You would say the one exception would be China, perhaps that might no that, that longer true. There's this, this real problem of a secular, of, of, a, of, a, of capitalism not functioning. And what we seem to be seeing now is like a new regime of like macroeconomic policy being introduced. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen, what the outline plan necessarily going to be. We can have a, have a good guess. One of the ways they, they, they talk about this, I mean, the other, the other problem on the secular stagnation is this problem of green transition, which is also driving a shift in macroeconomic policy. I don't know whether it's away from neoliberalism or a new iteration of neoliberalism, but there's something very something different going on. And the green transition is driving that because uh, the decarbonizing the economy is a problem which, which market coordination is very, very bad at and basically probably cannot do or cannot do in a way which, which gets us maybe it's from like 2.6 degrees And so there seems to be some sort of shift going on, a reintroduction of industrial policy, basically a uh, 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 reintroduction of large amounts of government spending where the government is choosing the, the, the winners, basically. The government is making active investment decision. The biggest example of that is Joe Biden. I think four lots have introduced a series of, of, of measures such as the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a huge, very large, um, a new wave of public investment, basically, to drive this green transition. There's a political battle available to us about what nature that green, that, that huge amount of new public money is going to take. Basically. At the moment, the, what it looks like is going to do is this, uh, this idea of de-risking. What it's going to do is launch a new wave of public-private partnerships to drive the, the green Public-private partnerships, where public money is used to facilitate or de-risk to take on the risks of private investment. Right? So we understand this. It's like we know this. The risks are all socialised. The gains are all privatised. It's incredible. And that's so the idea would be this huge amount of, of funding, anywhere from thirty-nine trillion dollars to people have said almost. Act. What we could, the result of that, if it goes into public-private partnerships, 
will be that all of the new infrastructure around energy and the infrastructure is going to be developed uh, and deployed uh, during this decarbonisation process will end up in private hands, but not just private hands, it can be incredibly centralised. In fact, most of it will be owned by asset management companies, very small amount of asset management companies, you know, literally in the hands of six companies on a, on a global level. Like the vast majority, which is, uh, which is an incredibly frightening prospect, basically. Because they will own all of the infrastructure and we will have to rent that off them. Uh, and we'll have no control over how that is governed. All of that is a huge way of, of setting up this problem. But instead of public private partnerships, we think there's a political argument here that we need public common partnerships. So, a public private partnerships is this public money you can de risk to take on the risk of private investment, or private ownership. With public common partnerships, the idea is that the state de risks projects of common ownership and governance. The public common partnership that would be this. Um, And I'll, I'll explain why that, that our thinking around this is linked to this problem of transition, this, this idea of transition. So public private partnership, we've got quite a long history. The UK in particular has like a long, long history of this. They call it the private, the private finance initiative. So in, in around uh, the, the first decade of the century, a huge amount of hospitals, roads and schools built by this private finance initiative. And it's now it's that the whole project is, is seen as a disgrace and a scandal now because um, well, there are all sorts of reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the main problem is that uh, all of this infrastructure ends up being, being private hands without any, um, without, uh, any demographic oversight. But the problem is that the public private partnership, they're almost like they develop the conditions for their own furtherance, you know what I mean? Public-private partnerships. Well, they centralise wealth in, 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 in very few hands, and that wealth can be used to influence politics on a wider level. Two, they create a cadre of people who want to drive this forward. So in the UK, they developed a basically almost like a class fraction of, of, of uh, public man managerial, uh, sort of public managerial class, or public so like politicians, media, and people who would exercise the management. People from one to the public will go into the managerial, they'll cross over and make their money. The politicians will move from being a politician to running one of these private infrastructure companies, etc. In the UK, they've got a terrible reputation. Our, the privatised um, uh, waterworks, their sewage in rivers, sheets spewed all over the beaches, the trains don't run. If you wanted to get to the beach to go on holiday, a wading ship, you can't get there because the trains are so catastrophic, basically. Um, but, like they, but this final fact that they can see as an absolute disaster, they have to contain within them the, 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 the means of generating uh, further public-private partnerships, no matter whether their results are good or not. And we have to think that like, we've got to do public-public partnerships, we need to think about that, that as well, basically. We need to sort of develop the basis of support for it. Um, Yeah, so uh, one of the ways in which we've been, we've been thinking about these public common partnerships is um, they are a mechanism or a strategy proposing public common partnerships, directly alternative to a particular public private partnership. They're a way of politicizing these public decisions that are being made to hand these huge amounts of resources over to public to private hands. Most people didn't understand this when they had the first rate in the UK. Very hard to politicize it until the effects were clear. If you're presenting an alternative and saying, no, you should be de-risking this common ownership project for this site that you're talking about. So we're concentrating political campaigning around this particular public on factories, basically politicizing the procurement decisions of public procurement officers. And it's so hard to make public procurement sense. But like, it's going to be a key area of political battle in the years to come. The other way in which um, public on partnerships can work to produce the conditions for them to grow is that you know when you so what these public common partnerships are talking about the moment the top of what we're trying to do is to, to get people to participate in the governance and ownership of, of particular projects. Two very interesting talks talking about how public 
participation is the best training in democracy, participative democracy. That when people get, participate in actively running and governing assets, infrastructures, they can learn this. It's like a training to be a democratic subject, which we hope will spill over effects into wider democratic, into wider democratic change that we need. One of the other things that we take from the, the neoliberal revolution, the, the neoliberal project, is that uh, part of the neoliberal project was to insulate economic decisions from democratic pressure. So you try to remove economic decision making and investment decision making in particular from anywhere that democratic pressure can get to. The most obvious example of this is central bank independence. So in the UK, the bank is, is notionally independent in its operations from the government. And that's what we're about to ensure there's no democratic oversight of the key democrat of the key economic decisions basically, to where de de democratize society. When we design our public on a partnership, what we're trying to do Decision making, insulate that from the pressures of finance capital, the pressures of, 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 of finance, etc. It's like a reverse engineer once again on this idea. And that the key of all decisions we can make in a democratic fashion, like what we propose is decisions over investment, investment is the, are the key decisions upon which you need democratic control. Under a capitalist society, but what, what society does with its social surplus decides the direction it goes in. <coughs> That's just how it works. In a capitalist society, decisions over, over the investment of social surplus are given over to private hands, those who have the most wealth, decide what they've built, etc. And the public has some sort of influence over that. What we try to insulate as well is like the ability to make democratic decisions over what gets invested in. revolution that we've been subjected to, the neoliberal uh, revolution we've been subjected to. Okay, so this is, a sort of, uh, this is the problem we're trying to address, how we're trying to address the problem of transition. And then, so we, first of all, we sort of mapped out this model of public common partnerships, or our model of public common partnership, in, in the abstract, basically. So the report that we wrote in 2019, so obviously we haven't been doing this work that long. Um, and the, the, this, the first, um, this image here is like, it's like an, an idealized um, governance diagram and financial flow diagram of the public common partnership. And so it's like a tripartite thing. There are three sorts of bodies that feed into the governing of this asset. Let's say this asset is a market in Tottenham in North London. So you have a representative of the public in some sort of way. Then you would have body which would make decisions uh, and feed into the general governance of this joint enterprise. And then you have the third body, the body of stakeholders, why have interests which aren't represented in the common association or have expertise or expert knowledge which will help make people, people make good decisions in this. So with this, this idea, the idea here is that uh, this new enterprise, this new joint enterprise, this new asset, whatever, will be capitalized 50% from local authority and 50% from the common association. In actual practice, perhaps it takes a very different form. The local authority is de-risking um, investments which are under the control of the common association. This enterprise might make a surplus. The mark this market in Tottenham in, in North London would make a surplus. It's a market, it's going to be developed into housing units, etc. surplus will be used towards the operating goals of the enterprise. But importantly in this diagram, the rest of that surplus is given over to the common association and get to decide where that will be invested or what will happen to that surplus. And the idea is that that surplus will be invested in a new public common partnership. So we get to this next part of the, the diagram. This diagram here is quite self-explanatory, I think, so I'll speak about that. That's a little joke. This is a, this is a, a, a sort of diagram of what we can call the, the expansive, self-expansive dynamic of the commons. 
So that was, each one of these letters is, is one of these public common partnership enterprises. Each one of these numbers is like an investment cycle. So public common partnership, A of R in North London, uh, has made a surplus. And this this common association has decided it wants to de-risk and help to found a new public common partnership. Community nursery further down the road in Tottenham. Then gets invested. So they, they are doing something like this, but you can't understand capitalism, you can't understand capital just by looking at the, 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 the corporate form, how a corporation organizes itself internally. You can't understand what capitalism is, is from that. You need to understand the capital, you need to understand it as a circuit, a circuit in which a surplus is moved from one um, enterprise to another. So what we're trying to think about is how do you make chains of, of these commonly owned and governed organisations assets? Make chains of them that ultimately a circuit of them. So capital has a self-expansive dynamic. You know, in previous forms of social organisation, um, the surplus of, of, of social surplus was used by perhaps an emperor or a king or something, and they built a pyramid or they built a pyramid. The, the, the palais of Versailles or something like that. That's not generally how it works in capitalism. The surplus of capitalist enterprises is taken and primarily reinvested in another capitalist enterprise. Each one is trying to grow. And so capital has a self-expansive dynamic, which is what makes it so difficult. So to counter that, we're trying to think of how you get a self-expansive dynamic into the common. There are contradictions in that and those are the contradictions that we sort of work out. This work I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking about here is um, I do with um, some friends and comrades in a new organisation called Abundance. You can sort of see that the abundance, when we talk about abundance, we actually, we, um, this, uh, this theory of abundance fits in within a sort of deep growth idea of the economy. It's something that we're trying to do here is like not just think about how wealth is transferred from one um, enterprise to another, we're thinking about how wealth is transformed. democratic decision making about what happens with their surplus is to try and get people to and when we insulate it from the, the, the influence of finance, to try and get people to think about what they value, to do their own processes of value. What do we value? What do we want most in our local area? That's a process of not wealth trans transfer, but wealth transformation. Okay, all very abstract. Let me uh, talk about a couple of um, a couple of um, actually existing project, you can put it on an abstract level and then you, it becomes um, a very different prospect when you have to bring this into, into being. So I'm going to talk first about this, it's called the World Corner Community Plan. Um, it's a big, big building in Tottenham, in Rome, and Tottenham is not Latin village because the marketplace within this building is it's a, it's a central hub of the Latin American community in London. Um, and so this market has been there, the building has been there for uh, 20 years. Uh, and then 20 years ago, there were plans put into place for it to be demolished and for a new urban development to take place. And I'll tell you about the urban development if you want, but you can guess it. It's going to be luxury apartments and then a new market which will be made of like multinational stores, etc. And uh, the traders in the, in the market organised a campaign, there were people in the area, and they campaigned for like 12 years this and eventually they thought, look, there's no point us going to the, to the council and saying we don't want this, we have to come up with an alternative plan for the site or otherwise it's still a problem. So they then started the process of developing a community plan for the site. Then in 2020 we got involved, they asked us to, to try to develop a public common partnership community plan, alternative plan for the site. Then in 2021, in June 2021, they gained a really great victory because they defeated the developers and they developed a greater who drew their plans the area, they have a huge amount of campaigning and organising in order to do this. Um, and as it stands now, the local council, the building is owned by Transport for London, who run the tube lines, etc. All of these parties are, are, are backing the community plan, there's going to be a final decision made in the next couple of months. Uh, but we basically know that we're going to get sites. <laughs> this is no other plan being, all the other plans are being removed. So let me just show you. Do you remember that three part diagram that I showed you? That's what they put across the top of the head when you get to an actual, um, an actual site.
side like this. So in this, in this um, diagram, this is, the, this is the governance diagram on where financial flows will go, who controls what in this sort of diagram of the community plan. The public, the public or the public part of the public goal partnership being represented by Transport for London, which is a quasi-public body, but they own the building. Um, and they own the building because a tube line runs very close to the underneath it. They, they're, they're worried about they won't sell the building outright because they don't want the building to be altered and it's collapsed or fall the tube line. Um, these are the market traders, they, 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 um, an organisation which emerges out of the campaign. Um, and we think this is the most interesting. As we wrote services to develop trust, it's not a sexy name, but that is the Commons Association, the common association in this diagram. Um, so this is this is how this is the World Forum of Community Benefit Society is, is how the whole the whole project will be run. Um, and this is a way, this area here is where different competing interests get negotiated and worked out. That there is where different pressures affect the operations and the decisions that are made. There will be some um, uh, community investments, community share issue, etc. There's also there's also going to be some uh, funding and some patient capital, all underwritten by Transport for London because they own lots of other assets in, in, in London. So that all takes place then at the surface after the operation of this goes to the West Green Road Centre Sisters um, Development Trust, which is, which is uh, it's sort of set up by out of the campaign, but that's a democratic body that anybody within the local area can join, basically, to help decide what happens. And the surplus goes to the West Bank Green Road Service System Development Trust and they decide where to invest in. And the financial modelling is after two years, there will be £2.3 billion a year going into that West Bank Road Service System Development Trust. So after you've serviced your debts, etc. So that means, or we need to repair debts, that doesn't come into it here, but that's insulated here in West Bank Road. At the moment, there's a campaign of, uh, of, of uh, community organising in the area, door locking, holding meetings. We're holding meetings where people are doing these workshops and saying, if you have two point three million pounds to spend in Tottenham, what would you like to see here? People sort of, it's like a way to try to fill out this, make it to, to make this a mass membership organisation. The minute's got five thousand members, we only had like twenty thousand members. Like um, okay, so that's the West Bank Road Services Development Trust. And I, I'll just talk very, very briefly. I know I've talked for a long time. I've been telling you this is a similar urban development project. Which is a city in North London. So, so London is a, is, is a very hot property area. Uh, property prices are incredibly high, very difficult to order. Bradford, very different. Uh, there's no investment in Bradford. It's a industrial industrial city, etc. Et 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 there's a project here to make a call it the People's Property Portfolio. A, this, this building here is called Victory House, and that will be a sort of. That, this has been agreed, it's been taken over. And that will be, there'll be like a theatre there, there'll be an art space, there'll be community offices, a community radio station, a series of bars, a rooftop bar, etc. But their idea is that they will then take over a series of other properties in Bradford because they're incredibly cheap and they're all empty, the city centre is empty. There's a couple of different things which, is sort of, which are interesting here, I think. I'll just talk about this here. The West Yorkshire Community Investment Fund, that doesn't exist. That was a proposition that we were making to the mayor of the region. We say, look, what you need to do is to make a make a, this community investment fund which will operate a bit like the vulture fund for the commons, basically. So, so when properties become available in Bradford, if we could do, take that into community ownership, there will be a fund from the public where you can then go and perhaps get a low credit in the rates, etc. So this is an example of this is another type of element of our project is that public common partnership, they can be, you can make them now, we are making them now. But to get their full effect, you need a wide institutional change. You need the public to be on board in a way which they're going to set up a vulture fund for the commons, etc. So as well as not doing these projects, we're also making policy proposals. You should do this because this would allow Bradford to be um, then I'll just take you to a even even more different place than North London. This is the Isle of Sky, quite a remote area, and it, just off the northwest of Scotland. One of the development trusts we're working with there is in the Isle of Rasse, and the, the 
the total population of the Isle of Rasa is just 300 people. Very different environment to Carnivores, so they look a bit like carnivores when you eat meat. Carnivores are trying to change food production and consumption, so it is in line with the limits of, uh, of the climate, is the idea. So this seems like a very different environment to, to talk about in the London, but there are very similar dynamics going on in Sky as there are in, in Tottenham. In Tottenham, the big problem is these, these huge developers who come in. Developments extract all the wealth out of the area, take them out of the top of the circuit at the top of that goes out of the country basically. In a very similar way, that, that the main target for the carnival project is against salmon farming. So, industrial salmon farming is also a multinational industry, it's an extractive industry. In fact, the, the, the funds get extracted out of the outer sky and they go to Norway, that's just where the salmon farming multinationals are, are based. Salmon farming is really bad for the environment. Sea lights and all these things are quite horrific. Pictures of what it does to the sound of faces, sea lights into the sound of faces. The fear is to the environment, but also the wages it pays are very low. So it doesn't allow for the community to repair itself either. Right? So we wanted to try and create an alternative to that, which would be ecologically reparative, but also socially reparative. And that's figured by this image here, which you can't really see. It's called the oyster table. And at high tide, it's an oyster farm. There's a series of cages where the oysters grow, they can harvest, etc. But at low tide, it becomes a, a set of tables and chairs where the community can gather and discuss and make decisions and these sorts of things. And so the proposition for this is there will be a, a network of commonly open governed polyculture aqua farms, which will do things such as grow oysters and seaweed, which are, which are um, which basically regenerate water. They pollution out the water, etc. They good for the they regenerate water and of course the common ownership will regenerate the, the community is the idea. And um, the other thing that, that um, we have a part of this project is um, is tile manufacturers so we've developed a process or not me personally, but people in the project have developed a process to make tiles out of the, the waste shelves and shelf Shells from it. So the people who initiated this are, are an artist collective called Cooking Sections. They were nominated for a very big art prize in the UK last year, the prize. They're very famous. So they've developed these tiles. At the moment, they can sell these tiles for £20,000 each. <laughs> it's a lot of money. But we're going to use that money to invest it back in tile manufacturing to try to make it mass production. So we, we mass produce these tiles. They're no longer an art object, but they are. And a building tool or an every, everyday decorative object. So we're trying to take the money off the bridge to buy art and basically mass produce those tiles so the original art object is no longer scarce and so its value gets to be, be um, destroyed in some way. I don't know what's on the art object, but that's the way we like to think about this. We're trying to take these money and turn it into something which alters our conception of wealth in some sort of way. Okay, I promise I'm going to stop after this slide. It shifts from, from something like urban development is where we started and then like rural development perhaps, food sovereignty is what the area you might talk about. And this is something very, very different and it's an ambitious project. So um, in 2021 a network of, of people got together in France to try to think through this idea of producing pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical uh, medicines basically as a commons. It's a network primarily drawn from people who work Basically, pharmaceutical engineers and production workers, primarily engineering researchers. And along with people who work on the, on the commons in France, and, and health activists as well in the sort of network. And the, the impetus for that was, the, was COVID and the, the public private partnership model of producing the vaccines, basically. Which meant that because they were producing this public private partnership model, where the state bears a huge amount of the costs of this and all the profits go to. Big pharmaceutical company. They basically they, they refuse to allow generics of the vaccines to be produced, and lots and lots of people in Dorset died. 
I've got them hot finger on it, but it's within the hundreds of thousands to million sort of level. And it was like, that is the problem we have to, see, have to address. It's a very, very difficult problem. Um, so yeah, so this is a project to, to do a public public partnership model on pharmaceutical production. And we're pursuing two sites, one in Paris and one just outside of Lyon. Um, and it, yeah, so this, this is a, it's, it's a very difficult project to, to sort of think through. So for instance, who is in the economies association? The cost of where is it going to be feeding into the control of what takes place in pharmaceutical production? But in, a, in, a, in an urban development project, the community involved, quite obvious, they live there. That's in community. Pharmaceutical production is much more different than people have group because the supply chain of pharmaceutical production are uh, international. The, 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 um, the, the people receiving those medicines, etc., that's on international level. Because we decided after a big look, series of discussions that in fact uh, we were thinking about it in the, in the wrong way, in a, in a different way. It's like once we remove pharmaceutical production from the inheritance of the market, or the, the inheritance to maximize profits at all times, then you are presented with a different model of healthcare. It's amenable to a very different, more holistic model of healthcare. For a pharmaceutical company, you're Actual medical intervention, there are of course there are chronic <coughs> illnesses which need of which will always be medicine, but for a large amount of medical intervention, you actually want to stop taking pharmaceuticals basically. And of course there are all sorts of other elements that feed into health basically. So we decided that the common health association would be once again drawn from the population, the democratic body would be drawn from the population. They would produce a, a percentage of the surplus from the, from the operation of the factory, and then they would be tasked with making health, public health interventions in the locality, basically. Which basically, and you know, with the idea that perhaps you would set up with public common partnerships, but that opens it up from just health into things such as traffic, access to food, etc. Uh, health opens up into like, I'm um, to think through a huge amount, basically. All of those things. Environmental factors leading to health because of like the because of the economics of um, of pharmaceutical production, like, like the, the the initial factories will have to concentrate on out of patent medicine, basically, uh, because the, the, the cost involved of, 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 of guiding from the public into production is a secondary testing phase, which is very expensive. But the idea is we build up the the money and capacity to develop a sort of research and we can start with publicly owned and controlled, commonly owned and controlled research and development aspects so that then we can start to, to try to commonize, bring the, the, the patents of new vaccines, new medicines into a common knowledge of biomedicine. Probably that is. I'll definitely talk for so long, I can't remember uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, So there's another diagram I haven't got here where we're, we've moved from this stage where uh, we have to think through how uh, pharmaceutical production is organized, it's organized on the chains, there are vulnerabilities in pharmaceutical production, there are, some, there are active ingredients which we need in order to produce the, the, the pharmaceutical. Those can be under the control of very small amount of, of companies and if a big farmer wanted to put us out of business they would just control this source of the active ingredient, etc. So then it's like, okay, actually have to think about, in order to protect this, this PCP, we need to have uh, PCP around active ingredient. And it's leading us, in fact, into the literature around democratic planning, about how you democratically plan a sector of your plan. And so the other thing we're trying to work out is how these things can link together. And um, you start to think through how you produce a network of public, public common partnership funds and production, but in an alliance with small to medium sized private producers who sign up the idea is to try to get a network together as soon as possible, which can be a viable competitor to the big pharma companies. And even if you're not a viable competitor to the big pharma companies, yet, right? as far as like people who do public procurement and who are now sort of trying to negotiate with big pharma, they have zero power because there's no alternative. Right? They say, look, you can't do this, you can't charge this much in our country. And big pharma say, well, fuck off that. Who are you going to get to make your medicines? As soon as you even have that into a viable alternative, the 
power dynamic changes. So that's going to think for the public on partnership. In our way, it's like this like from the public to society and to democratic control, but it also works back again. It's like an electric work back in the time. Okay, I'm sorry I talked far too long. <laughs> Um, 